right. Well, I think we'll get going so the director can get back to work. Um, The subcommittees on interior and administrative rules will come to order. Without objection, objection the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Um, thank you, Director Ash, for being here today, and thank you, committee members. Uh, this is a joint hearing, as I said, of interior and the administrative rules subcommittees of the oversight committee. And it's also the second part of the hearing examining barriers to species recovery under the Endangered Species Act. Yesterday, we heard from panelists uh, and members of the Interior Subcommittee regarding the challenges facing species recovery efforts. And we heard good ideas from both sides of the aisle about the challenges with getting species recovered and off the endangered list. We heard a lot about litigation and rigid statutory deadlines that cause problems for both the Fish and Wildlife Service and local conservation planning. Not just dollars, but in personnel and man hours. We also heard about state and local efforts to conserve species and prevent listings. I hope the Fish and Wildlife Service, the rest of the administration, and our colleagues in Congress will be able to work together to improve the Endangered Species Act. It has not been reauthorized in over 25 years. Director Ash, I know you've had a busy week, uh, appearing first before the Natural Resources Committee on Tuesday to discuss critical habitat rules and then here today, as well as committees I probably don't even know about. I appreciated hearing you say a couple days ago that the gray wolf in Wyoming and the Great Lakes is recovered. You've said that on numerous occasions. We appreciate your science and acknowledgement of that, even though removing it from the endangered species list has been blocked by seamless, uh, endless litigation. Um, it is an example of one of the frustrations that members of Congress, um, people who conserve species on the ground in the states, and, and the service are having uh, with this endless litigation. There was one of the people who testified yesterday who brought in a chart of the history of litigation on the gray wolf, how many times the service has recommended delisting, proposed rules for delisting, and how many times uh, environmental uh, litigation uh, that industry has chosen to uh, go to a non-knowledgeable uh, judge and get it back on the list. So hopefully we can discuss some other species today and other areas where the ESA and this administration's implementation of the ESA can be approved for the 21st century. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Congresswoman Plaskett may have some thoughts uh, on the endangered corals that she testified about yesterday, uh, at least in her statements and the frustrations they're having in the Virgin Islands with this subject. So what we see, quite frankly, is that people in their communities who now have an environmental ethic embedded in their regulatory regimes, in their people's hearts, uh, and in the manner in which their communities conduct business has not been recognized and the ESA doesn't keep up with it. We seem to have an environmental litigation industry that is protecting its own status by keeping the ESA back on a 21st century uh, statutory and regulatory trajectory. The old command and control the federal government knows best. But that is not the case anymore with regard to endangered species. Expertise lies in our communities, uh, and uh, we should be taking advantage of it as we advance uh, the Endangered Species Act to a 21st century model that actually will recover species. I was disappointed to see that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service revised the proposed rule for the process to consider listing petitions. Uh, I had previously complimented the proposed rule because it gave states a larger involvement in the process. 
and improve the quality and accuracy of the species information being submitted to the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it would have, under its proposed um, uh, implementation, improved the service's ability to more effectively manage the petitions and hopefully focus more on science instead of unproductive litigation. Unfortunately, when the rule was reported out a couple days ago, that provision was weakened. And it looks like, uh, to me, that groups involved in the environmental litigation industry who are trying to protect their own turf may have uh, had influence uh, over uh, the end result of that, which because they're making a business out of suing you over petitions. And catering to litigation-focused organizations isn't going to get us anywhere. They refuse to entertain ESA changes whatsoever because they have a very lucrative business model, and it's working for them, and they don't want to surrender uh, to people who are really more concerned about recovering species on the ground. That said, I hope we can have a rational discussion today to find common ground on what should be our common goal of an Endangered Species Act that serves both species and the people of the 21st century. Director Ash, thanks again for joining us today, and I look forward to our discussion. Um, I uh, would now like to recognize uh, Mr. Cartwright uh, for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I thank the chairs for holding this important, important hearing. I welcome the opportunity to look for ways to improve the administration of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the ESA is the strongest and most important federal law protecting imperiled wildlife and plants. For 40 years, the ESA has helped prevent the extinction of our nation's wildlife treasures. Um, including beloved American icons such as the bald eagle, the humpback whale, and the green turtles. Uh, my own state of Pennsylvania has 14 federally, federally recognized endangered or threatened species, including the northern long-eared bat and northeastern bulrush, uh, which are both known to be present in my own district. Uh, the protection and recovery of these species has demonstrated the clear merits of this nationwide scientific approach to protecting our wildlife, as has been mentioned, the ESA has prevented 99% of the species listed as endangered or threatened from becoming extinct. During this time, the Fish and Wildlife Service has continued to improve its methodologies. Scientific advances have given us a much deeper understanding of nature and allowed for better programs for protecting endangered species and starting them onto the road to recovery. The regulatory tools of the FWSs uh, have also become more effective through the use of the Candidate Conservation Agreements, the CCAs, and the Habitat Conservation Plans. The, the FWS has been able to work proactively with private groups to find a balance between economic activity and the protect, protections needed for vulnerable species. These programs represent a win-win in allowing for productive use and enjoyment of our lands while also allowing endangered species to recover and keeping them from becoming endangered in the first place. However, CCAs and habitat conservation plans, like the rest of the Fish and Wildlife Services programs, only work because they are based on sound science. No two agreements or plans are alike. Each has different circumstances with different implications for various species. And there are no shortcuts in science. And the agency has to do the work in order to be able to approve these plans. It takes time and it takes funding. And when funding is cut, work backs up and it becomes harder and harder to run highly effective offices. This is also true in the private sector. If you don't put the right money to, toward the resources, things don't work. Resource intensive programs such as the CCAs and the HCPs are no exception. In addition, when an agency loses staff to budget cuts, it becomes increasingly difficult for it to function. With these budget cuts come 
missed statutory deadlines, such as those for reviewing a petition to place a species on the endangered species list. These missed deadlines are what leads to lawsuits from concerned citizens who have a right to see their petitions acted on in a timely manner. I urge my colleagues to consider the benefits of better funding for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd also like to remind them that the fastest way to see more species removed from the endangered species list is by giving FWS the resources it needs to ensure the species recovery. So I thank our director, Ash, for appearing today, and I thank him for his service and the vital work he is doing to protect our nation's wildlife. Director Ash, I look forward to hearing your testimony this morning, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I understand that uh, the chair of the regulatory committee does not have an opening statement. Very good. We also have with us today uh, Representative Pierce of New Mexico. Um, welcome to this committee hearing. Uh, we will waive you on to fully participate in this hearing uh, without objection. So ordered. Um, thank you. I'll hold the record open for five legislative days for any member who would like to submit a written statement. And we will now recognize our distinguished witness. I am pleased to welcome the Honorable Dan Ash, Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Welcome, Mr. Ash. Pursuant to committee rules, witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. So please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. And Mr. Ash, you are recognized. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lummis and uh, committee members. And I just uh, would say, Ms. Lummis, I, I hope uh, perhaps this is not the last time I have the opportunity to testify uh, before a committee on which you are a member, but you've always, even in disagreement, <laughs> uh, you've always treated me with great uh, courtesy. And, and, I, and I, for one, will miss your thoughtful uh, contribution to the many debates that we've been involved in uh, and uh, wish you the best. Thank you very retirement. much. Um, the, and apologies to you, and, and Mr. Heiss was here a moment ago, but uh, some of what I'll say today is uh, a little bit repetitive of what I said in, before the Natural Resources Committee the other day, but um, the, back in 1972, it was the 92nd Congress of the United States, and President Richard Nixon, who joined uh, in creating a visionary and powerful law, the Endangered Species Act, with the goal um, of preventing species extinction, and it has been remarkably successful. 99% of the species that are listed are still uh, with us today. Um, and think about the context of that. Um, the United States population has grown by 65% um, in that period of time, from 210 million to 323 million people. Our gross domestic product has increased 314 um, percent, five, from $5.25 trillion to $16.5 trillion uh, economy. Um, and our individual per capita gross domestic product has increased uh, from $24,000 to $51,000. So we have prospered as a species, uh, we have prospered as a nation, and we have prospered individually during that time. And, um, and because of the Endangered Species Act and the other great environmental laws of that era, we have prospered in our time uh, without erasing important parts of the natural heritage of our children and grandchildren. And in, in this administration, I believe we built on this great legacy of success. We have delisted more species due to recovery than any prior administration. And before the end of this administration, uh, uh, with uh, some good graces, we will have delisted due to recovery more species than all previous administrations combined. Um, 
and we, it's not just that. We have forged um, innovative and effective partnership, as, as the uh, chairwoman has indicated, to, uh, to conserve species before listing is necessary and averting the need to list species, like the um, Arctic grayling in Montana, the Sonoran desert tortoise in Arizona, uh, the New England cottontail, and the greater sage grouse. And um, many things have contributed to that. Um, but several things have specifically enabled it. Uh, first, the multi-district litigation settlement um, early in this administration that got us out of court and onto a sensible schedule that allowed these partnerships to, uh, to grow and, and blossom. And a uh, very powerful and progressive partnership with the Natural Resource Conservation Service in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which has incentivized voluntary private land uh, conservation on working landscapes. Um, also, our ability to set priorities um, and focus on how to achieve them, uh, to accomplish recovery with the limited uh, dollars that we have been able to secure from, with the help of our appropriations committees. Um, and, and finally, because uh, we have uh, believed um, in the, and adhered to the words of Henry Ford, um, who, who said, um, obstacles are those frightening things that you see when you take your eyes off of your goal. Um, and so uh, we, uh, I, I prefer and we have preferred not to see barriers, um, but to focus on the objectives of recovery, uh, to apply ourselves to recovery, and I believe our record is an exceptional one that we can achieve and accelerate recovery if we gather resources, gather partners and partnership, and put them to the task. So I look forward uh, to today's hearing and discussing how we might continue that record of success. I thank the director, and now uh, each member will have five minutes to ask questions, and um, uh, I will begin. Uh, Director Ash, uh, I'm, I do want to ask about how the rule that was proposed came to look different when it was released this week. Um, I was hopeful that some of the ideas that uh, had been put forward with regard to consulting uh, carefully with states and local governments uh, before a listing decision um, is made or uh, uh, a petition is responded to by the service, that that would create the kind of opportunity uh, for states to be on notice, for local governments to provide uh, the science it has with regard to uh, species, uh, and that we could have and begin that upfront dialogue. When the, um, when the rule was reported out this week, it didn't look like that anymore. So c how did that occur, that change? So we, we published our proposed rule making changes to the petition process, and we received a much critical comment, I guess I would say, from certainly from organizations that petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but um, from uh, members of the public at large, from members of Congress, um, and uh, um, who um, felt like the changes we were proposing were too burdensome. But in our reproposal, and we have reproposed, not finalized those regulations, so we're putting them out again with revision for additional public comment. Um, they retain, in my view, the essential elements um, of the original proposal. That is, the petitioner um, is limited to one petition per um, species, um, so they can't send us a petition with 400 and, you know, 404 species, which we have received, what so-called mega petitions. Um, uh, so they, the petition has to be limited to, uh, each petition is limited to one species. Um, and then also they have to provide that petition to the, uh, the states uh, where the species uh, reside 30 days ahead of time. Uh, they have to notify the state. And so that process of notification will allow our state partners to be aware, to engage, to provide us uh, with information ahead of the listing uh, petition, we, us receiving the listing petition. So we have that available to us um, as we begin the process of considering the petition. 
Sounds like the comments you received said it would be burdensome to provide states with that upfront involvement. Do you believe it would be burdensome? I, I do not. I, you know, the original proposal that we made, I did not believe was excessively burdensome. We were requiring them to provide the petition to the states in advance, and then we were re requiring them to incorporate information that they would receive from the states um, as they finalized their petition process. They felt, members of Congress, others felt that that was unduly burdensome. And so we, we have backed off on that, but we have not backed off on the basic proposition that they should notify the states um, 30 days ahead of sending the petition to us so that then our state partners, should they desire, can engage with us at that point. Have you seen during your years as director uh, an increase in the scientific knowledge with regard to species at the state and local levels? Um, I think, uh, y yes, uh, states um, are uh, extremely competent. Our state fish and wildlife agency counterparts are extremely competent, um, professional, scientific organizations. And yes, they, although state budgets like ours have, mm -hmm. have struggled and states in many regards have lost important capacity, but as a whole, our state partners are extraordinarily uh, professional, uh, competent uh, managers. In my state of Wyoming, uh, what I've observed is uh, a, a tr tremendous leap in the ability of local and state governments to respond to the uh, recovery process uh, through using conservation easements, mm -hmm. uh, in going hand in hand with the NRCS. And you pointed out earlier that the NRCS has become a really good partner with regard to conservation. I would echo uh, that sentiment. Um, but I'm concerned that the, the scientific knowledge resident and the recovery efforts resident in the states is not being acknowledged uh, by the greater um, uh, Endangered Species Act community, particularly uh, the uh, environmental litigation industry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would observe uh, that uh, we're in the 21st century, uh, that changes have been made, that locals are embedded with an ethic uh, and an understanding that wasn't present in the 1950, probably wasn't present in 1973 when the ESA was adopted. Uh, but the act and the way it's being implemented is failing to keep up with the um, expertise on the ground, uh, the, uh, the ethos of the people in this country, uh, and that it still remains a command and control, heavy-handed regulatory regime when um, states and local governments are, and individuals are far more able uh, to um, recover species in a way uh, that uh, is vibrant and can get them off the list. Um, assuming that you also are in your last eight months or so, nine months, uh, in your position, as am I, um, what advice would you give uh, with regard to the future implementation of ESA? Well, I think in, you know, in, uh, it, with all due respect, I, I would disagree with your characterization. I think that the ESA and our implementation of the ESA has changed, uh, and, and the emblem of that is the greater sage grouse. So um, rather than start from the uh, beginning, a, 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 you know, an answer that is, well, we just need to decide whether to list the species or not, or not list the species, we built a partnership. We started in 2005 and we worked with the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to build a corpus of science between the federal government and, and the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. We, we, we gathered the United States Geological Survey. We built a partnership, the, the Sage Grouse Initiative with the Natural Resources Conservation Service that put nearly half a billion dollars worth of technical assistance on the ground with private landowners. We, we uh, built a partnership with the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service to plan over uh, 70 million acres, um, over 70 million acres of the of the public estate, 
and, and, we got, and we were able to find that the listing of the sage grouse was not warranted. And, and that is really emblematic of the way we're implementing the Endangered Species Act today. And as you've said, to me, that's a 21st century conservation model, and that is the way we need to do business more in the future. But I will say that, you know, the, the regulatory power of the Endangered Species Act is necessary. Um, when you need it, you need it. Um, and uh, when a species is on the verge of extinction, uh, you often need to take strong measures to protect it. Um, we should use that as a last resort, and I, and I think that's been our record. My, my time has expired. I yield to the gentleman. Oh, Hello. welcome. Thank you. Are you, would you. Do you have questions? Yes. All right. Uh, I yield to the ranking member, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you, and thank you, Director, for being with us, and to Madam Chair, thank you for, for uh, this, this hearing. Um, I have a few questions, um, and you already started uh, addressing it. One of the, uh, in studying this process, the reason species are listed for protection under the Endangered Species Act is a failure of the states to protect them from extinction. Um, do states have the ability to be proactive and to implement their own conservation efforts before a species needs to be considered for listing? Uh, many states do, and I, and I believe that when we list an, a species on the endangered species list, um, Ms. Lawrence, that it is a failure for all of us, that, that is telling us that that we as a, as a country have failed to protect it, and there could be many contributors to that. Um, sometimes it's beyond our control, like the northern long-eared bat that was mentioned here uh, before that is being the extinction or the, the crisis facing the bat is being driven by an invasive fungus that came from Europe uh, to which they um, have not developed natural defenses. And so, um, sometimes there are things completely unanticipated that none of us are prepared uh, to deal with. But I, I would say, um, going back to the analogy with the sage grouse, that partnership would not have taken hold were it not for the, in, the important incentive that was provided by the um, Endangered Species Act. They, people came together because they wanted to avoid the listing. They, um, states engage because they wanted to retain their authority uh, to manage the species. And so it was really that, um, the specter of a listing that, that sparked that partnership. And without that, I don't think that that partnership would have emerged and would not be as effective. And, and that, that's, the Endangered Species Act is important as a regulatory tool. It's important as a to incentivize that kind of partnership as well. And one of the things I really wanted to highlight, in fact, states have sometimes failed to provide the plans mm -hmm. to protect the species, and sometimes that deficiency has been the grounds for a court to reverse an agency's decision to delist. Um, if I could read a quote from the, pertaining to the Wyoming Gray Wolf case, and I quote, a failure to explain how a state plan to allow virtually unregulated killing of wolves in more than 50% of the state does not constitute a threat to species. Uh, there are other examples. Could you please comment on that? Because that is something that when the frustration sometimes that we see in states and communities is why aren't you delisting it, but there has to be a plan uh, provided by the states? Yeah, the, when we delist a species, we kind of have to walk backwards um, and defeat the original reason that we listed the species. So we have to go back through the five factors that the law um, uh, uh, outlines for making a listing decision. And we have to show not just that the species is recovered, but that the threats have been eliminated. And so off, most often that requires uh, state-based plans and regulations so that we can say, once we've delisted, we're not just going to go right back. Um, and, and that does require effective, uh, defensible state plans. In the case of the Wyoming wolf, as you mentioned, 
the, the judge disagreed with our determination that the Wyoming plan was an adequate, provided an adequate regulatory basis. And we're working with Governor Meade and the State of Wyoming now to see if we can remedy those deficiencies, and, uh, and I believe that we will be able to do that. And I, I, when looking at the frustration that we have heard during this hearing, that is an area that I feel the partnership mm -hmm. could be stronger in developing the plans with the state. Mm -hmm. If we're, if it's going, you know, so there isn't that reversal of delisting because we have a clear and structured plan to ensure that we don't retreat back to that. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady and yield to the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Jordan. I, you I are th recognized. I, I thank the chair and thank her for her work on this issue and a host of others. Um, Director, this is not even close to being an area I have any expertise in. I think in my nine years of Congress, this is the first time I've ever had a committee where we even talked about this particular uh, issue. So let me just ask some, some basic questions and, and uh, Maybe you can give me some, some numbers. You said in your opening testimony, you have, del in your time at, at Fish and Wildlife, you've del delisted more species than any, than all the previous administrations combined. Is that correct? Uh, we, we have currently delisted more than any previous administration. If we stay on track, and I believe we will, then we, by the end of this administration, we will have delisted more than all administrations. How many combined. species are currently listed as I believe, endangered? I believe it's 28, I believe. Currently. Mm -hmm. 28, that's it? That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how many have you delisted? How many species have been delisted? Oh, I thought he asked. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, 28. 20. The number that have been delisted due to recovery, I believe. That's the number. How many are listed is what I ask. How many species are currently listed? All the species that are enlist, listed as endangered. Uh, domestically, uh, about a, a little over 1,600 species are listed, and another, uh, I think, 400 foreign species. 2,000 species Close currently 2000. listed as endangered. That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. 2,000. And how many have you delisted? 28. 28. Wow. Okay. Um, and do you list more in a year than you delist? Yes. Are you, the list is getting bigger? The list is getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when are we ever going to fix it? I mean, so we got 2,000. You've only delisted 28. Wait, is that what, this, what you've done, this administration? Or is that, how many have been delisted in all the years since we, how long have we had the loss? In 73? 72. So since 72, so in 40, 44 years, mm -hmm. uh, how many species once put on the list have actually come off the list? I be, Is um, that the 28 number? I, I should get the number for you. Some species have come off the list because they, have, uh, because they are extinct. Um, uh, but uh, so I believe the total number is in the range of 40 or 42, but uh, I, I can get that for you for the record. Holy cow. 2,000 on the list and only 40 ever come off. I mean, the idea is to actually get them to come off the list, right? The idea is to, to twofold, to prevent extinction and to recover. But you just told me some of them that come off the list come off because they were extinct, so that was a failure. That would be a failure. Yeah. Most, mo in, in several of those cases, they were probably extinct before we listed them, but uh, we have taken them off the list because they are extinct in the wild. Okay. So I just, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I had no idea what, what the numbers were. 2,000 on the list, 28 have come off the list in 44 years, and some of them that come off the list were because they actually were, went, that species went extinct, and we're adding more to the list each year than we're ever bringing off. Is that a fair summation? Yes. Holy cow, I just, I had no idea it was that, that. Okay, well, uh, when, I mean, with all due respect to your opening statement, I, but you say you're doing a great job, and I mean, the, the goal is to get these species off the list. And Okay, so let me ask this question. What implications, when, when a species goes on the list, what implications does that have for private property uh, owners in a respective area where this species is located? The, when a species is listed, the law prevents take of a species. So that could be harm, harassment, kill, 
Um, so the law prevents the, in, I'll say, injury uh, to a species and its habitat. Could it, could, it, could it mean that a person involved in agriculture may not be able to farm exactly the way they were before? Um, it, it, do, it usually does not mean that. Usually does not, but it could. It can. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Will, will the gentleman yield? Be happy to yield. Uh, Director Ash, I'm, I've dealt with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Yes, sir. Your, your characterization that it may not affect other aspects of private property I, I think is a little okay. I did not. Please, uh, that, that's what the gentleman was getting to. If you can make that clearer for the committee, because it, because it does. It's not just the taking of that particular species. It's other activities that potentially could endanger that species, which has a very broad definition according to Fish and Wildlife. Is that not correct? I, my answer was that the law prevents injury to the species or its habitat. So. Um, so or risk or what? of or risk of injuries to that species. I, I'll, I'll be glad. Uh, I'll yield back. I, I, I appreciate the patience of the chair, but I think further clarification, Director Ash, would be in order. All right. The gentleman yields back. I recognize Mr. Cartwright of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Chairwoman Lummis, and may I also say I'm going to miss you when you're gone too. Um, Director Ash, when Congress passed the Endangered Species Act in 1972 and President Nixon signed it into law, uh, we did so because of our nation's species, uh, because many of our nation's species had, and I quote, been rendered extinct as a consequence of economic growth and development untampered by adequate concern and conservation, unquote. Congress recognized that our imperiled species were valuable to the nation and that extinctions could be prevented. My question is, do you believe American species continue to face challenges to their survival and that they still need protection? We face extraordinary challenges. As I said, you know, today our, our nation stands at 323 million people. By the middle of the century, the projections are that we will have 400 million people um, in the United States of America. Globally, uh, we stand at 7.3 billion people. By the middle of the century, we expect the, the planet to share the planet with 9.5 billion other people. And so as we occupy more space on the planet, um, uh, that means there is less space for all the rest of creation. And so unless we work hard to make that space for them, they will disappear. And so what I think we have shown with the Endangered Species Act, and, and the, the, it is true, recovery is a long-term endeavor. It took um, the black-footed ferret is a great example. It took centuries uh, for us to get to the place where we believed the black-footed ferret uh, was extinct in the wild. And then in the early 80s, uh, they were discovered in Wyoming. And we have brought the black-footed ferret, a species once thought to be gone, we have brought it back um, to the point where we are now talking about recovery of the black-footed ferret. That takes decades to accomplish. Um, it's, like, it's not like a sports injury. You know, an injury takes an instant to happen, a concussion or a, uh, or a broken bone. Um, it takes much longer to recover from that injury. Now, let me jump in here, Director Ash. Uh, my colleague from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, uh, just uh, sort of cast up the idea that we're getting behind at the FWS about uh, taking endangered species off the list. It's not really a matter of showing up to work late and, and letting the paperwork pile up, is it? You no, have to not. make sure they're ready to come off the list because of efforts taken to preserve these species. Would you describe the process for delisting a species, please? So to delist a species, we do have, we have to, first of all, we have to understand the causes of its decline. And, and, um, and so oftentimes it's not crystal clear what is causing the decline um, in a species. So we have to, we have to gather the information uh, we have to um, understand what we can do to bring the species back. We have to build partnership. We have to put those efforts onto the ground. We have to gather the resources to put those efforts on the ground. 
Um, we have to demonstrate, in fact, that recovery is working and the species have rebounded. And then we have to prove that the threats have been eliminated um, and, um, and that we have adequate mechanisms in place to sustain that recovery. So it's, it's scientifically and technically challenging. Um, it's, uh, it involves social and cultural um, work and understanding. Um, it involves um, the ability to, to project into the future and see what's going to, and, and understand well what's going to happen in the future. Well, not to interrupt you, but uh, Director Ash, I understand that the effort to bring back the American bald eagle from near extinction took a long time. Uh, am I correct that the bald eagle first received protection in 1967? It did. It was one of the, uh, you know, it was one of the species listed in a predecessor law um, to the to the now Endangered Species Act. And would you tell us when the bald eagle was finally delisted from the Endangered Species Act, Director? Delisted in 2008. And so 40 years, right? 40 years of hard work involving the federal government, the Fish and Wildlife Service. We. We banned the, the pesticide DDT in large part. That was the, the, the limiting factor for, for bald eagles. So we had to ban that pesticide. You have to have time for those pesticides to cleanse, you know, be, be removed from uh, the ecosystem to the extent that eagles could continue to reproduce. Um, the rivers like the Potomac River here in Washington, we restored rivers so that the, the uh, so that the, uh, a fish in the river could sustain bald eagle pups. So a lot of work went into it, and I say thank God that Congress had the foresight to pass this law and that President Nixon signed it into law. Amen. Thank good we, goodness we all had the patience to wait those 40 years and save our national bird. Amen. And I yield back. And uh, um, Mr. Mul Mul Mr. Mulvaney, the gentleman from South Carolina, is recognized. I thank the chair. Um, Director Ash, thank you for doing this. And uh, like many of us, I will fully admit uh, I know this much about what we're talking. You, you have forgotten more since you sat down than I will ever know about the, this particular issue. But I do I knew, know a little bit. I want to ask you a little something about the, the long-eared bat situation. Because uh -huh. it strikes me that this may be a little bit different um, in terms of how it's become threatened, how it's be It's not technically endangered. I think it's threatened. Mm -hmm. Nothing that mankind is doing is threatening this bat, correct? The bat is threatened by, a, by an invasive virus from Europe. That is the cause of its status. You said before that one of the things you have to do is uh, to determine the causes of a species' decline. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're not clear, but here it's really, really clear. It's one of those, we know exactly what is threatening this creature, and it is this white-faced virus or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yet, by virtue of listing it, um, we have implications for agriculture, silviculture, a bunch of different industries that have absolutely nothing to do with the reason the creature is threatened, right? Um, so just a couple of points. You, yes, you are generally right. I would say back up a little bit. The white nose syndrome came to the United States because man brought it. We, it was brought in trade um, into the United States. So it came here as a result of, of human economic activity. And then, um, yes, uh, it, it is the disease that is driving it, but what's important to understand is we listed it as threatened with, and when we list a species as threatened, the law provides us the ability to tailor the restrictions of the law. And, and so we did so, we published what we call a 4D rule um, for Section 4D of the Endangered Species Act. And we have, ex we have exempted all of the activities that you uh, spoke of from regulation, except for protection of known hibernacula. So we're protecting them in their caves when they're hibernating, and we're protecting known nesting trees. So when they're having pups, which is a short period of time between June and, and August, uh, protecting known nesting trees. So we're protecting the very sensitive life stages um, for, the, uh, for the animal. Um, to help us hopefully support uh, sustaining and ultimately recovering it, but we've exempted um, all of I get of that, that, and I understand that, that you, you have t uh, tailored some of the restrictions mm -hmm. and so forth, but I guess what I'm getting at is none of the restrictions that you've placed on other industries, property owners, farmers, mm -hmm. 
has anything to do with whether or not this creature will survive. Either we're going to figure out a way to solve the virus problem, the bat itself is going to evolve to the point where it can deal with the virus, or it's going to become extinct. He, um, but what, what are the restrictions that you believe we've placed on people? Uh, my understanding is that you've got restrictions on where trees can be harvested, uh, the time that they can be harvested. You can't harvest in the quarter mile of a cave uh, where the bat has lived or lived. You can't harvest within 150 feet of a known maternity roost tree. Right. And my, again, know this much about this. It's a this. pretty narrow restriction. It is, and I understand you tailor it, and I get that. But again, doesn't speak to the survivability of the creature. But it does, because if we, so this is a species that is, so take it in the context of a, of a, a human illness. Say I, I had a, an illness and I was, you know, and I was facing that, you know, illness, a cancer or something else. Um, the doctor would want to protect me from other infection or, or things that were going to, that were going to um, uh, cause me kind of further damage, right, so that I could recover. And that's what we're doing with protection of hibernacula and, and nesting trees is we're trying to, to keep additional disturbance. True, and I get that, and, I, and it might be more sympathetic survival. if this particular creature only nested in a particular kind of tree. My understanding, again, fairly new to the topic, is that it doesn't. It doesn't pick pines over oak. Or it's, it, it, no, it does it, not. It will nest Fairly just about anywhere. And I guess plastic, my question is, we sit here and do the cost-benefit analysis. Yes, it, to the extent man-made man activity caused the, caused the problem in the first place through trade and the virus coming over from Europe, the people who are effectively being punished had nothing to do with that mm -hmm. and nothing to do with any other thing regarding the, de the decline of this species. So, so the... Um the, again, the restriction, it's important to, to, to hear all the words, are known nesting trees. So what we're saying is where we know of a nesting tree, we're not requiring people to go out and do surveys, we're not, we're, we are just saying where we know there's a nesting tree, we should provide a buffer around it for two months. And, and um, very briefly, there, if I may, and I'm sorry to cut you off at my time, if you could maybe talk 20 seconds if the chairman would give us about the efforts that FWS is doing on research on the disease, because that's ultimately what is going to save this, this creature or not. Yes, and, and Congress has been very helpful, and leaders like uh, Pat Leahy and the Senate have been enormously helpful in getting, uh, uh, in getting us funds to, to uh, do research on the, on the nature of the disease, the, the vectors, the way that it spreads across the country and how we can prevent it or, uh, or um, limit its uh, spread. But ultimately, that is going to be the, the way that we help these bats recover, is to help them find a way to get them through this, uh, this crisis, this health crisis. And that's where we're focusing our efforts. And that's when we did our 4D rule on the listing, that's what I said, is we need to spend our time on the problem, not spend our time um, regulating a lot of activities that aren't the problem. And I've taken criticism from the environmental community for that. Uh, we've stood up and said, we're going to focus, as I said in my statement, we're going to focus on the problem. And, um, and we're going to do that like a laser beam. And Congress has been very helpful in getting us funds and the United States Geological Survey, the funds that um, are needed to, uh, to learn more about and tackle the white nose uh, syndrome problem. Thank you, Chair Lee. Um, and thank you for asking the question. It's a 39-state uh, issue right. with the bat, so it, it affects a lot of people in this room. Thank you. Um, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Desaunier, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Director Ash, for being here. I want to ask a couple questions um, more related to things I think sometimes seem tangential to the argument, and of course in so many things here it's about balance, and certainly the ESA has proven over the history of its implementation and its um, action into law as balance. So coming from Northern California, and as you know we have uh, many discussions around our drought and our infrastructure for water that you're in the middle of about the ESA. As somebody from that area, um, the act was meant to be driven by analysis and science and proper funding of that. And it helps, um, in my experience, when you have that proper analysis, when there are lawsuits that 
seem like they're out of balance uh, when it comes to one side or the other. So first off, on the science, over the history of the Act, have we provided enough analysis and enough funding? You just mentioned that we have provided some more, in your view, both to defend your actions, but to do it in a way that I believe the original Act um, was passed in, that it would be less politicized, although there's always a role, of course, for politics and subjective view, um, but that the science would direct us. Um, no, uh, I think in the in the you know history of the law, have we you know science you know if, if we look at the challenges that we face in implementing the law, you know oftentimes people focus on litigation as a challenge, and I would say you know as an administrator, um, litigation can be frustrating, um, but science and the availability of information to um, empower innovative and creative solutions to understand uh, the causes and the solutions to species decline um, is a much greater uh, challenge and obstacle to to the to our work than than something like litigation. Now, at least in my experience, maybe you could, if if you have the proper analysis from a staff position similar to land use, so that when you do have private rights of action and they can come from the left, um, you can more properly defend it and maybe avoid having the the lawsuit entered into in the first place. That's absolutely correct. And with two of the species that are delisted, um, the um, northern flying squirrel and the bald eagle, um, our delisting decisions were challenged in court. And so it's that scientific information, that credibility that comes from being an agency that speaks to the science um, is what helps us get past those and ultimately to delist those species. And on the other side that in Northern California we find to be quite compelling is the economic benefit of the ESA when probably done. So I think um, so the subjective opinion is the ESA is something that tree huggers like and people who um, disproportionately want to save the planet. But at least in Northern California, as you know, our fishing industry is very important to us. And it's a big discussion about not just preserving the delta for places for people to enjoy, but the fishing industry is a significant part of both Oregon and California's uh, economy. So it's a billion and a half. It's not a lot in, in the context of a $3, a $3 trillion um, GDP for California. But could you speak to a little of that and what kind of analysis you do um, for situations like that? So it's not just protecting the environment. It's also an economic factor in certain areas. Sure. A lot of times in, in the context of, uh, of California water, what we learned last year was the um, the, most of the pumping restrictions that occurred last year were restrictions that were put in place by the California Water Resources Board for, uh, because cities like Chico and Sacramento were bringing in water that was saline. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that tells you is that, you know, the Delta smelt essentially has been protecting those local water supplies because it's been protecting those freshwater outflows um, for, uh, for all of these years. And so it's it's a community sustainability issue. And also, as Secretary Jewell noted uh, earlier this week in her speech on conservation, the outdoor economy is a huge economy. It, 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 it provides more to the U.S. economy than pharmaceuticals and automotive uh, jobs combined. And so, um, it's a, so protecting these natural systems and the economies that, that depend upon those natural systems, it's not just about a species. Right. So the Delta smelt in our instance is the canary in the coal mine for our fishing industry. And it's right. a good thing to remember that uh, while I agree with many of the critics of the ESA, there are certainly situations where um, there's overreach from an economic and a scientific perspective, but that's why there's a private right of action. Um, but in this instance, it's good, I think, to remember that it can be an economic development tool as well when properly administered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. The chairman of the full committee is recognized. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you. And I want to follow up on what Mr. Desaunier was uh, uh, talking about. Um, and Mr. Ash, oh, I got to ask you: the Fish and Wildlife Service relies on science and data to make these decisions. We do. And who pays for the science and data? Um, science can come from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it can come from the United States Geological Survey, it can come from the Corps of Engineers, so the taxpayer pays for a lot. It can come from states, 
Um, so, but ultimately, it's all paid for by taxpayers, correct? Uh, not all of it. Much of it comes from industry. So we rely on industry in many respects for science. We rely on NGOs for science. And do you, does the Fish and Wildlife Service do all these studies in science themselves, or you rely on contractors and, as you said, industry as well? Uh, we all of the above. Is all of that science and data released to the public? All of the scientific, all of the science that we use in making our decisions is available to the public. Um, when, like when in the process do you make that science and data available to the public? Uh, we, it's constantly available. So with the Greater Sage Grouse, for instance, we had a website um, for the Greater Sage Grouse, and as information was made available to it to us, we posted it. On do you our make website. the the raw data? Available. If the raw data, if the raw data is available to us, we um, provide it. Uh, but sometimes, like in the case of, say, uh, the state of Texas, um, they they have uh, constitutional restrictions against providing uh, the source data because of private property concerns and other things. So they provide us with the peer-reviewed science. But anything um, that you generate, you you believe, is available to the public and the scientists prior to you making if a recommendation on a rule. Or we do. Yes, if we... All of it. All of it. Let me ask you about the, um, the, the move to, to, to push the Mexican wolf outside of its, uh, its uh, previous habitats, um, its historic range, if you will. Do you anticipate that the geographic area being different for that historic range for the, for the Mexican wolf? Um, you published, I'm not following. Fish and Wildlife Service has this map here, mm -hmm. and it shows the historic range for the, for the Mexican wolf. It doesn't include Utah. To be right to the point, we're scared to death that you're going to push forward a rule that says uh, we're going to make the Mexican wolf uh, and push it up into Utah. Is that the goal? Is that the intention? No, in fact, uh, our current um, 10J rule for Mexican wolf um, uh, says that if wolves go north of I-40, that we will capture them. I-40 in, in Arizona? I-40 in Arizona and New Mexico. Yeah, yeah New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe you have the authority to reestablish a species outside their historical range? Historical range is a... Is a um, is a concept that reasonable people will disagree upon. So range is what's important as we think about recovering a species. And what we need to know is, is what is the kind of habitat within which we can accomplish recovery. Um, and so we look at range. And historical range is important context um, for all of our decisions. But what's important in, in thinking about recovery is where where can the species exist, and, and where, does the, where do the habitat conditions exist? And so that's what is relevant to us as we build a recovery plan for a species like Mexican wolf. So it's your goal and intention that any Mexican wolf that goes north of I-40, you will recapture and bring back to where? Uh, south of I-40 to the recovery zone, and that's, that is our current, that is the current rule and the current practice that we're following while we work with the states of New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah on a recovery plan. We've agreed with the four states that in building that recovery plan, we will start first with a habitat analysis, looking at, at Mexico and southern Arizona and New Mexico, his, what you call historical range, and that we will look at the habitat and determine if that habitat can support recovery. If it can, then we will give that a chance to work with Mexico and in Southern New Mexico. I just want to New be Mexico crystal clear that you have no intention of trying to push the Mexican wolf up into Utah because based on figure 1.1 in the documents you have, uh, there is no Utah on this map, and I want to make sure that's still the case. Madam Chair, thank you, and I yield back. Thanks, sir. I thank the gentleman and recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And, uh, Thank you, uh, Director Ash, for being here. I would suggest that there may be a problem and a potential listing of an endangered species, the wily bluegill, in my neck of the woods, because last <laughs> Sunday didn't find many at the end of my fly line. Boy, I, that's, okay. that's a shame. We'll, uh, Pennsylvania boat 
Fish and Boat Commission is responsible for that. Well, <laughs> we'll keep checking it out. Um, according to uh, uh, witnesses in uh, prior hearings, uh, over the years the amount of litigation um, under the ESA has increased exponentially. At least that was what was indicated. Uh, why do you think that's incurred? I'm sorry. I, I did We're still thinking bluegill. Still sorry thinking about bluegill. that. I'm, I apologize for that. The, your your question. Litigation has increased, um, and why? Um, uh, what I'll have to do is get back to you for the record whether litigation has increased. I, I actually think that litigation has decreased uh, during this administration because we we engaged in this multi-district litigation settlement. So we had cases out there, you know, dozens and dozens of cases in 18 federal courts, and we threw a rope around them, we pulled them all in, and we forced a settlement. Um, and so we've gotten ourselves out of this, what, what we call deadline-driven litigation. And, and so I think actually litigation has declined uh, during this administration substantially. Well, it, it, that would conflict with the exponential increases talked about by a number of witnesses uh, with concern that, <laughs> yeah. uh, that settlements are taking place. Um, we had one large settlement at the beginning of this administration. People, and the people call it the MDL, multi-district litigation settlement. But what that has done is it's gotten us out of court um, because the law has very stringent deadlines that we're held accountable to. And so deadline-driven litigation was multiplying in, in federal courts all over the country. We kind of, like I said, we threw a rope around it. We forced the litigants to a, to a common table, and we reached a, a settlement that, 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 that allowed us to implement a, a sensible, priority-driven um, schedule for dealing with our obligations under the law. So, so then you would say that this has allowed you to increase your management? Um, it has. It, it's got, like I said, it's gotten us out of the court and on the ground so that we've been able to build partnerships in Montana's Big Hole Valley and, and avoid the listing of the Arctic grayling and working in uh, the, uh, with five New England states to avoid the listing of the New England cottontail and build those partnerships. So getting out of court and, and getting our biologists on the ground. Um, the in, in, Endangered Species Act um, uh, requires you to consult in, in many cases and re receive input from counties. Um, what level of engagement does the ESA require between federal and local officials? Whenever we take an action under the Endangered Species Act, a listing or delisting action, um, we are you know that the law actually requires us, which is a which is a rather antiquated. The law requires us to publish notification in um, in uh, papers of local or regional distribution. So um, we actually view that as an artifact. We, there are much better ways for us to communicate with uh, local uh, governments or than than newspaper. But um, but we engage at the local level. We provide notification. We do public hearings, like now in our proposal to delist the grizzly bear, um, we're doing, we had a public meeting in Cody um, a couple of weeks ago. We had a, a public meeting in Bozeman, Montana last week. So we, we actually have public meetings. We uh, take public comments. With that input, is, has that provided valuable assistance? It, it provides extremely valuable. On the ground information coming from yes. locals? Yes. From local people, from ranchers. Um, we, you know, we, with the in the context of the greater sage grouse, we were developing uh, con candidate conservation agreements with assurances. We ha our biologists were out on the ground meeting with individual ranchers in, in those cases, um, like in, in Wyoming and other places, getting individual ranchers to sign up for uh, conservation agreements, voluntary conservation agreements. Um, you know, I, I, I guess my question comes from a concern that while we, um, by law, have to, have to notify, uh, we deal with them to a point, and yet too often we hear the locals saying it did not impact us as human beings right. uh, with an economy issue that comes into place of being able to work in coordination with the federal government to the point that, of being positive. Uh, I would encourage more involvement rather than less and more consideration of the local concerns as a, a very, very important part of this whole uh, 
endangered species and management of our wildlife services. Um, uh, my time has expired. I yield back. And I, I agree with you on that point, sir. Um, the, the gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Director Ash, uh, you made a statement earlier in your testimony that implementation of the uh, ESA has, has changed, and it really has. Um, uh, in previous testimony, you testified in 2011 that your agency spent 15.8 of its $20.9 million uh, listing uh, program budget on taking substantive actions required by court orders or settlement agreements resulting from litigation, otherwise known as sue and settle. Um, that included, uh, in terms of sue and settle, that's, isn't that how the Lesser Prairie Chicken uh, got listed? It was from a uh, sue and settle suit, a consent decree? The, it is. Um, you know. The Lesser Prairie Chicken was part of the multi-district litigation settlement, but what that, what that settlement did was it put, was it, what enabled us to push the deadline back beyond the, the legal, the, the strict deadline in the law, so it gave us more time but the, the uh, problem, to work with the The range problem is, is that under sue and settle, you're bypassing Congress, you're bypassing states, um, you know, and that, uh, and that settlement, which um, um, it demand, uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service acknowledged that, that meeting the settlement demands will require substantially all the resources in the listing program, but it also um, shows that environmentalists and agencies successfully precluded all interested parties from participating in the regulatory process that eliminated the warranted but precluded option and tied up most of the agency's listing program funds. Now, the problem with these sue and settle cases is that outside groups are, are, are acting as plaintiffs against um, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And what I want to know is um, when these suits are filed, how many of them have you litigated to the point of it, if, if you lost at the lower court that you appealed? Well, the, all of the cases that were involved in the multi-district litigation were deadline cases. We have no defense. And that, so is there, that, is no, there is no appeal. Is um, that, I understand. I understand exactly right. how. Uh, right. They're deadlines. So we either right. we, we make the deadline or we don't. And so if we don't make the deadline, the law doesn't give us an excuse. But and that's so, not true if you litigate. If you, lit if you litigate the case and you lose in court, there is an appeal process. If you enter into a consent decree, there is no appeal. If, if, if the law tells us that we have to make a decision in a year and we don't make the decision in a year, the judge says you're guilty and, and puts us on a schedule to, to make the decision. There is no appeal. The Justice Department won't take that case on appeal because we're going to lose it on appeal because it's a simple matter of the law. The law All says right. we have to make a decision. Okay, let, me, let me clarify. When, when an outside group brings a suit against uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, do you go to court? Mm -hmm. Or do you enter into a consent decree? Well, it it's depends the on other. the it depends on the context. With the no, sir, I'm asking you: Have you litigated any yes. cases? Okay. We are right now litigating. We're appealing the Wyoming wolf case. We're appealing the Great Lakes uh, wolf case. We're we're appealing dozens of cases where the the decision is a substantive decision, and we believe we can win on appeal. With a deadline case, which most litigation under the Endangered Species Act are deadline cases, there is no appeal. Okay, let me ask you about this. You said that you also, um, some of the data is provided by NGOs. And on, um, uh, who are some of the, uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to give me the list now. I'd like for you to provide the committee with a list of NGOs that uh, have provided data that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has utilized in its determination process. Okay. I'd also like to know if any of the NGOs um, have sued the Fish and Wildlife Service. That's, uh, are oh, you sure. aware? They you know, have? Um, any Defenders of Wildlife, Safari Club, right. National Rifle okay. Association, uh, Audubon Society. They were in e the state of Alaska. We, we just yesterday got a notice of intent I, from I didn't the state ask of for New Mexico. List. So we're I, I, being, yeah. with all due respect, sir, I've got. I want to try to get through. A couple other things here, and what I'd like to know is, uh, prior to any suit being filed, have you or anyone at the Fish and Wildlife Service had meetings with any of these NGO uh, or activist groups or individuals or individual or any groups acting in support of or on behalf of any potential plaintiff against the Fish and Wildlife Service? Uh, we, we meet with all of these groups on a regular basis. Were I any meet of those meetings uh, uh, regarding. Um, 
if you're asking a question of whether we have ever, whether I've ever met with one of these NGOs and orchestrated a lawsuit that we could settle, absolutely not. Never. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The gentleman yields back, and I recognize the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning, Mr. Ash. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. Thank you. Good. You know, um, I had a couple of questions to you about the recovery, um, the road to recovery for our nation's species. Uh, and I'm interested in that for a variety of reasons. One is, of course, I know that you have a very difficult job at Fish and Wildlife Services. But I'm also interested in it because being from the Virgin Islands, um, you know, fishing and our waterways are enormously important to us. And the, uh, the list that uh, our coral have been put on is really a balancing for us in terms of our own economic recovery. Um, can you tell us what are some of the reasons species become endangered or threatened and if you expect the number of those threats to increase over time? Yes, and uh, your, your um, uh, coral, I think, is a, is a great example. So coral certainly can be affected by harvest, you know, people harvesting coral. And there's a vibrant worldwide trade in coral, which is a constant ongoing threat and one that we are, are fairly good at, at managing. We have an international treaty, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, where we can regulate um, sustainable trade in things like coral. Uh, the difficulty comes in the more insidious effects. And with coral, the, the effects being driven by global climate change, like rising uh, ocean temperatures. Correct, yeah. um, And acidification of the oceans are, mm -hmm. are um, a, Devast, potentially devastating impacts on coral. And so in order to recover coral, we have to become expert on climate change and, and the physical changes that that's driving in the environment that's going to impact uh, those corals. And then we have, to, we have to then learn how we might be able to abate those impacts and, and to protect and ultimately restore coral reef environments. It's a very, very challenging um, uh, uh, a proposition. So in the Virgin Islands, um, you know, we don't really have issues with regard to harvesting of our coral. No. Um, you know, we do, and in, in, in we have an enormous amount of enforcement that goes on along our waterways, and we recognize that not only is the coral important to our tourism to attract people to come and, and view it, but also because uh, it creates a, a really great barrier for us right. to, creep our, to keep our beaches uh, very calm and some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Um, but the climate change issue is really an issue that has affected us in terms of the water temperature rising, um, runoff from the hills coming into the water, uh, all kinds of issues. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and you know, as climate change, of course, increases, that will mean, of course, that uh, the coral will become more and more uh, of an issue and its extinction um, very real. But one of the things I wanted to ask you is how do you balance then the need for places like the U.S. Virgin Islands or American Samoa and Guam where fishing rights uh, and fishing needs are really important and the Virgin Islands for us to do development um, to ensure that we have the right balance. Do you do a balancing act in that respect? Um, you know, one of the things that I know that the Democrats are concerned with is funding for your agency. We have requests for biological opinions so that our developers can move forward that takes almost two years now mm -hmm. um, for a biological opinion to be done. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that, the needs of the people of some of these areas to be able to grow their economies with the need to balance the uh, care of the endangered species? Uh, thank you. And so once a species is listed, that decision we make solely based on the basis of the science and the threats facing the species. But once a species is listed and we develop um, critical habitat, we can take into consideration economic and other factors. When we do a biological opinion, if, if we write a, what's called a jeopardy opinion on a project or proposal, uh, we create things called reasonable and prudent alternatives, and so we can balance those things. But you have, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, uh, put put a point on a very important issue: is 
most of the work that we do under the Endangered Species Act is allowing things to happen, authorizing take of uh, injury to species. We do that through things like biological opinions. Uh, to make those things move promptly, we have to have experts in the field. We have to have biologists and, and other experts in the field to allow those things to happen. If you fly into Las Vegas um, and you, as you look to the, to the north and the west, um, you're going to see the world's largest commercial solar facility, the Bright Source Ivanpah Solar Facility. It sits in the middle of critical habitat for the um, desert tortoise. That was possible because we had biologists on the ground working with Bright Source and the project sponsors to make it happen, to work it into that environment and, and offset the effects on the desert tortoise. So we can do that, and we do do that, but it takes people, resources, science, uh, to allow those decisions to be made. Oh, I guess, you know, in closing, my concern is that it takes too long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have developers who come and they are excited about doing a project. Mm -hmm. They're willing to make the mitigation and the changes that fish and wildlife, that national marine fisheries request. Mm -hmm. But by the time they get around to um, giving an opinion or giving them the, the mechanisms that they need, it's two and three years out and they pull themselves, pull their money, and the people of the Virgin Islands are, as I said yesterday, our lifestyles, are, our livelihoods are about to be extinct because of that as well. So my question is, what is the amount of funding and the support that you need moving forward to ensure that places that are not as large as Las Vegas and have the influence and the power, but place smaller places like American Samoa or the Virgin Islands mm -hmm. can do what they need to do to create a sustainable balance between the environment and people being able to live and work and remain in their homes? Well, I'd, I'd refer you to our, our pending request before the um, uh, House and Senate Appropriations Committees. We have increases in our budget for listing, increases in our budget for, um, for um, recovery, um, increases in our budget for candidate conservation, all, and increases in our budget for science, all things that will help put, put people on, in, on the ground, in the field, that are going to help make those kind of decisions. Thank you for the extension of the time, Madam Chairwoman. And I will be very supportive of that appropriation. And I know that my colleagues on the other side who are interested in getting this delisting done would need to support that as well so that you can move it along and, and the economies can grow. Thank you. Yeah, the gentlewoman is uh, welcome. And uh, the gentleman um, from uh, North Carolina, Mr. Meadows is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for your leadership on this uh, particular issue. Ms. Plaskett was uh, starting to sound like a Republican. I'm going to start to sound like a Democrat. And so let's uh, see if... Never. <laughs> Never, Mr. Meadows. I didn't say you <laughs> were one. You. I said you started to sound like one. Uh, it's a big difference. But uh, so let's let's look at this because I've, I've had a lot of experience with U.S. Fish and Wildlife as a developer. And, and so I can speak to and address some of the concerns that were just raised by my colleague opposite. And yet at the same time, probably have a long track record uh, from a conservation standpoint of, of not only set asides, but allowing for uh, what I would say responsible development. One of the frustrations, uh, you just heard it from my colleague, is a lack of response in a timely way from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and not just U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And let's face it, it's, uh, it's, it's a number. But we get into this struggle, Director Ash, mm -hmm. where U.S. Fish and Wildlife many times inserts itself either late in the process or gets involved in the process in what I would say a turf war, uh, Trout waters in Western North Carolina being a prime example of, of that, whether it's a local jurisdiction, a state jurisdiction, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, their buffer set asides and so forth. So that being said, some of those aspects really hurt conservation processes, i.e. if you have anything that potentially could be viewed under the jurisdiction, uh, it is best either not deal with it or try to uh, make sure that you don't have to deal with it. And so uh, 
if the budget requirement, what we would like to hear at this committee is if indeed the appropriations are given, because we can always ask for additional money, is a plan on how that would actually speed up the process. Because more money doesn't always speed up the process. Uh, you know, bureaucracies can grow. You have an unbelievable staff behind you. They, they're the ones I know that are doing the work. You're getting the heat. Uh, one day it will be fair that they will get the heat as well. No. <laughs> but as we, as we look at this, let me, let me go a little bit further because I, I'm troubled by two or three things that have come up in your testimony and knowing that it's coming from someone who wants to help you. You mentioned about the litigation. Mr. Palmer was talking to you about the litigation and how that time frame uh, that if you, you're, you're missing your deadlines and so you're going to get a a verdict against you because you're missing the time frames. So how do we make sure that we make those time frames? Are they too short? 90 days? The, the timelines are, well, like just briefly, we get a petition to list. I have no, no, I knew the process. Yeah. So uh, it's about yes or no, are they too short? Uh, there are people behind you that are nodding their head yes. <laughs> so, uh, they're, they are strict deadlines. I'm All right. Say that. So if, if I, we, if uh, you haven't answered yes or no, are they too short? Um, no. In, no, they're not too short. So then why are you missing? Um, because I don't have the dollars to match those deadlines. And so, so I if think, we gave you 100% of your requests, would you meet all the deadlines? I, during this administration, you're under oath. I have met, we have met our deadlines. And no, so, no, the sue and settle part, you just, in your testimony just a few minutes ago, that's not what you said. You said that the reason you, you had to go into some of these uh, settlements was because you were going to miss your deadline and the judge was going to rule against you. You so can't was, have it both ways. That was the backlog that I inherited. And what we did was we settled the case and we came up with a because the time frame was too short. Because the time frames had been, you know, we had, we... Why, why do you not want to say the time frame's too short? The, the, time, the, the time frames are the time frames. What I have to do uh, but, is... But we could them. change those. You can change those. So, so it's, shouldn't it's up, we change those? It's up to you to determine whether... I'm giving you a softball. Short. Shouldn't we change those timelines and make those longer? I, it would depend on, on the entire context of a proposal to change the deadline. The deadlines are an important aspect of administering the law. These are, these are No, they're an important aspect of making a decision which necessarily doesn't, if, it, it doesn't make you implement the intent of the law necessarily. Well, these are challenging decisions and prior to the, to the timelines being... So would you support extending the time frame? Uh, given the overall context, I could support changing. All right. Thank you. So let, let me finish up. That was a long ways to get to yes on that. So let me, let me tell you my, my other concern. Having dealt with sound science and sometimes what I would call arbitrary science in terms of protected areas, your comments to Chairman Chaffetz with regards to the recovery area you indicated that you're dealing with Utah and Colorado in terms of the recovery plan. You wouldn't have, if it's truly that at north of I-40 you're going to bring the Mexican wolf back, there is no recovery plan because the way that you said it was if there's habitat there that you're going to allow that to continue on. And there is habitat in Utah and Colorado that would probably be very similar to New Mexico and Arizona. There, there is. So, so if that's the case, is your testimony that is that you're going to allow that recovery process to go above I-40 into Utah and Colorado? I'm going to let the science decide where... The so the answer is yes, then. We, if you were talking about habitat, a couple director. Of things. First of all, we have a recovery plan for the Mexican wolf. The states of, of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona have asked us to revise that recovery plan, which we are doing in cooperation with those states. We have agreed to let the science decide. We're going to look at where the habitat is. But in the meantime, as I explained to Mr. Shavitz, we are... Um, we are 
uh, agreeing to limit the wolves to south of I-40. So we have... In, in the meantime, but, but Mr. Chaffetz's point was, will ultimately the folks in Utah and Colorado have to worry about the Mexican wolf reintroduction into a place that was not historically their habitat? Yes or no? Should they be concerned about that? I, I, I'm, and I'll yield back. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you because I'm trying to get through this. So, uh, it's like a Democrat, it goes on forever. <laughs> you, you may answer the question. I, I don't believe the people of Utah and Colorado need to be worried about anything. They're being represented by their, um, their state officials in the context of this recovery plan, and they're being their interests are being represented well. Um, the gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Mr. Heiss of Georgia. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Director Ash. It's good to see you again. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, it was sir. a pleasure finding out that we actually grew up within a few miles of each other. Right. And so you will appreciate my concern that the bat seems to be endangered with the Atlanta Braves these days, and anything you can do to recover right. that would recover be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Being a Nationals fan, I, well, now I, I have to, you know, <laughs> um, go with the home team. Well, let's go continue down these lines of the recovery plans. Uh, they obviously have decreased, and yet they're uh, important to getting certain species off uh, and removed from the, the endangered list. Just from another perspective of trying to wrap my mind around it, why have the number of uh, recovery plans decreased when they are vital to removing some of the species who perhaps are not endangered any longer? Um, I, I, yeah, I don't believe the number of recovery plans have decreased. Uh, of the of the 1,600 plus species that are listed um, under the law, I believe we have recovery plans for nearly 1,300 um, so, and of the species that have been listed more than three years, it takes time to develop a recovery plan. Of the species that have been listed more than three years, 85 percent of those species have recovery plans. So I, I think we've been, again, we've been making good progress in building recovery plans, but it's a length, it is a lengthy process as well. Well, the information that we've had is recovery plans have decreased from 843 in the 90s to 177 today. Are you saying that's not accurate? Oh, no, we have, way, we have far more than 177 recovery plans. Okay, I would like to, if you could provide that information. I, I will do to that. Committee. I would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so then you're saying that the, the recovery plans have not decreased, mm -hmm. and therefore there is no problem with the ability of FWS to, to recover and delist species. No, the, the recovery is a, is a challenging endeavor, as we've talked about in a number of respects. Recovery is a very, can be a very difficult, very challenging, long-term endeavor. It is a long-term endeavor. I would say um, an example that But came, the recovery plan is not interfering with the ability to delist species that need to be delisted. Um, I would say you know, the availability of a recovery plan uh, can be a limitation, in the, like in the case we were just talking about with the Mexican wolf. I think a, a, a revised recovery plan um, can help us in building a pathway to long-term recovery for the wolf, and that's why we're working on it. So in some cases, it can be a necessary step that we need to take, and it can be a limiting factor. But in most cases where we have recovery plans, we're working uh, we're working. Well, how come we're not recovery. seeing species delisted? Um, I think the, the majority of species that are listed and, the, and, the, and a, a, a strong majority of the species for which we have recovery plans are stable or increasing. And so I think across the board we are making progress toward recovery. It's it seems slow... to me that we have a lot more species getting on the list than we have species that deserve it getting off the list. Well, that, uh, I think the species that deserve it, that, Again, in this administration, as I said, we've targeted investments to species that are near the end of that process of recovery, and we're getting them off the list. And I think we're getting better at recovery. We're building durable partnerships to, you know, achieve that long-term success. And, and I, I think the record that I'm talking about for this administration will be a short-lived record, because I think we're seeing the, we're beginning to see the effects of several decades of work on recovery. And, and we're showing that targeted investments can, 
can get species over that final hump. And so I think the record that I'm talking about and I'm proud of, I think it'll actually be a pretty short-lived record. I, I think you're, you're making this very difficult for me to wrap my mind around because it, it does not appear Sorry. to me that species are getting off the list. It is, it's an enormous battle to get species they, off the list that deserve to be off the list while more and more are getting on the list. And it all obviously creates problems. Let me go back to a, a question because I've only got a, about 30 seconds here. Uh, you said earlier that you have multiple meetings with local governments and different groups and all that sort of thing, and yet we heard testimony just yesterday as to how often federal government tends to ignore, in, in your case, mm. local governments, which is the truth. I mean, you may be meeting, but uh, local government input is important, and it appears as though that really is not taking place, although, as your testimony, meetings are happening. Well, I... I Again, I, not to be argumentative, but I think that that in, input is happening. And we, so the recently, earlier this year, we lived through the occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And, and if you were listening to that debate, you heard the people in Burns saying that, you know, they were solving their problems their way because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with them and has worked with them for a decade on a comprehensive conservation plan for the Malheur National Wildlife So Refuge. was the testimony yesterday accurate or inaccurate? I, if, if I'm hearing it correctly, I believe it's largely inaccurate. I, I think that Harney County, um, Oregon, um, which where the Malheur Refuge exists, um, we have a candidate conservation agreement uh, with assurances, and during the Malheur occupation, John O'Keefe, the head of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, was saying, we're working our problems out with the federal government, and we're working through the candidate conservation agreement process. We have come to uh, an agreement. And so we're working with, at the county level, at the municipal level, which not, not to say that we're perfect or infallible, but I think we are demonstrating that we, we can um, and do um, work well at the at the local level. We can do more if we have more people in the field to do that kind of work. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, we're expecting votes. Uh, I've done a disservice to the four remaining members by uh, running a very ample and generous clock. So with their permission, I would like to give each of them on a rotating basis the opportunity to ask one question and we will rotate through one question uh, at a time for the remaining four members here until votes are called. Votes have not yet been called. So, um, gentlemen, are you okay with that? And it would happen in this order. Mr. Buck, Mr. Carter, Mr. Gosar, Mr. Pierce. Are you okay with that? Sorry, I, it's my, it's, uh, I, I did you a disservice because the clock I ran was very generous. Uh, Mr. Buck, you are recognized. I don't know how I can just ask one question, but I'll do my best. Thank you very much for being here. You, um, uh, Congressman Palmer asked you a question earlier. Uh, I think it was at the end of his questioning, and, and he said, uh, do you or anyone in Fish and Wildlife Service uh, basically coordinate uh, on these sue and settle cases? And, and your answer was that you don't. And, and my question, my follow-up question to you is, um, are there uh, um, institutional ethical rules in the Fish and Wildlife Service that would prevent that? And, and do you have a comfort level that those rules are being followed? Yes, I do. And it, w it would be an ethical and a, and a legal um, a, a, a violation. I can provide those uh, to you for the record. And, and yes, I'm talking about the, Sur the Fish and Wildlife Service writ large. We, we do not do that. There is absolutely no, no evidence to show that that has ever occurred. If it did occur, it would be a serious infraction. Thank you. Okay. And you will get another question, Mr. Buck. I'm just going to rotate through until votes are called. Um, uh, Mr. Carter of Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Ash, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources has had great success with the state wildlife grants. In yes. fact, um, Georgia DNR was, was awarded a, a, a wildlife grant for the long, to restore the longleaf pine forest, mm -hmm. and, and that was a great program. It was one that was um, 
in, that we're hoping is going to be able to keep the, the gopher tortoises off of the endangered species list mm -hmm. and it's working well. It's my understanding that it, to be eligible for those grants that a state or our territory must develop a comprehensive wildlife con conservation strategy. Is that correct? That is correct. So it's my understanding that all 50 states have done that and, they, they and that would lead me to believe that and, and I hope and I think you would agree that, that all of our states have an interest in, in addressing their unique situations and in, in trying to, to face the issues in, in each state. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that. Good. Well, it, is, it has been a great program and, and I compliment you on it and Georgia, Georgia Department of Natural Resources has done well with it. Yeah, Dan Forster is a great leader in Georgia yes. and, I would, and I would just say that again in our, in our, um, in our fiscal year 17 budget we have, a, we have proposed a sizable increase for the state and tribal wildlife grants and that's exactly what you're talking about. We, we have an interest in helping build capacity for our state partners as well. Great. Well, anytime we can get it to the states, yeah. I'm for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. you, Madam Chair. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, is recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman. Director Ash, have you studied, uh, studied up on the draft compatibil compatibility determination for the Havasu National Wildlife Refugee Refuge announced by the service last week that aims to close significant areas to motorized boating on Lake Havasu? I, I have not. Wow. You, you know, your Deputy Director, Jim Kurth, knew detailed information about this proposal when I questioned him on March 22nd, yet you claim to know nothing, which seems unbelievable. Um, remember where I stopped on here, because I've got a couple of other questions to drill you on. Thank you. The gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Mr. Ash, for being here. Uh, you made a comment that uh, says the people in New Mexico have nothing to be concerned about. Uh, you might be interested to know that today they're filing suit against you for releasing wolves in a pattern that they don't agree with. So they do find a little bit to be concerned about. But my question is really about the, uh, about the bald eagle. Uh, the recovery of the bald eagle is complete. It's nice. It's safe. It's good. It's grand. You still charge people $250,000 for taking of bald eagles, don't you? Under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Yes, yeah. sir. So you do that. You charge them 250000 dollars under something. I I don't believe we've charged anybody two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but, but you have the right to do that. The law provides for penalties, yes, sir. Okay. Because it's, it's a fairly serious matter. You have a national bird, but you also have an endangered species. It's not but an endangered species. You have a species that was endangered that might slip back onto the list, and so we're gonna protect them by Significant fines, is that more or less a value judgment? Um, we have a law that we are responsible for implementing. The law provides protection for bald and golden eagles. Okay, so my question is, sir, mm -hmm. how come, why, in this revised rule to ensure long-term monitoring and protection of eagles while facilitating renewable energy development, you give 30 years, 30 years wind farms can take as many bald eagles as they want. It's as if the species doesn't exist. It's what it says, sir. No, it does not, sir. It does not say they can take as many bald eagles the as they want. The revised rule, a result of extensive stakeholder engagement and public comment, extends the maximum permit tenure to 30 years, subject to five would, year recurring. They would have to have a permit. The permit would authorize us. And you to, have given a permit. You have given permits. We have not. We have not given any 30-year permits. You have given five-year permits, which then work into the 30-year permits. You have given five-year permits or not? We, uh, I can we, provide the document where it says that you did. I don't know if you actually did or not. We, we have given, I think, a couple of permits, uh, but the, the law, again, requires them to get a permit. It requires them... So if you get a permit from you all, it's okay. Have you given any permits to oil and gas wells? Oil and gas is where we make our living in New Mexico. Oil and gas is how we do it. So you've given permits to wind farms to take for five years and num any number of eagles they want. Have you done that to any if, oil and gas operator yes. in the country? If they, if they applied for a permit, we would give them a permit. You would give it to them, not you would met, review it. You would if, give it to them. If they met the requirements of the law. They oh, now if we met the requirements. Ah, Isn't that important? Isn't it important to meet the requirements of a law? I don't know. How come a wind farm can kill as many as they want? They can't kill as many as they want. It they says can. this. In here, you show get a me, permit, you can do what you want. Show me the words, you can kill as many as you want. The gentleman... Uh, I would from, yield back. Thank you. The thank gentleman you. from Colorado is recognized. 
We're much mellower in Colorado. Than <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with the marijuana laws. We're just <laughs> mellower people. Um, I, I, my car broke down. This is a true story. My car broke down. I went to a, a ranch house and, and um, uh, asked the rancher for some help. And, and he, when he found out I was with the feds, uh, he turned bright red. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah uh, that's the way I felt also. Yeah. And, and uh, his concern uh, was his ranch uh, uh, area. Um, he was having some problems with uh, the sage grouse. Right. And uh, it's in western Colorado. And uh, he was uh, very upset about the plan that had been implemented because uh, he, uh, what he wanted to do was he wanted to, uh, uh, and he said, I could send my grandson out with a, a 22 and take care of this issue. What we need to do is we need to kill the predators of the sage grouse, not build more habitat for the sage grouse. And uh, when he uh, uh, brought this subject up to uh, the uh, people that were gathering the information, they um, uh, were not thrilled with the idea of having teenagers out killing critters. Um, if my car breaks down again in the same place and I see that rancher again, what do I tell him? Um, I, I think, um, well, I, I, I think you tell him that, you know, I hope his fears are, are not justified. I think we have been working with ranchers and I, I, I was told by a, by a rancher, Jim Stone in Montana, that, you know, you know Dan, if you ask a rancher for help, He'll give you the shirt off his back. If you tell him what he has to do, he'll fight you tooth and nail. And, and I think that's the approach we've been bringing to the sage grouse. And, and we've, we have been uh, working extensively with the agricultural community. And we do not see ranching um, as a problem. We actually see ranching as part of the solution to keep lands working, um, but to, to make sure that, we, that we're ranching to standards that are going to support both. And, and in Harney County, Oregon, which I referred to before, we had a rancher, Tom, Tom Strong, who said, you know, what's good for the bird is good for the herd. And so I think what we're trying to do is work with the ranching community. And we may stumble, and, and, and I understand that people are, are concerned about uncertainty, um, and we're going to have to prove ourselves in the long run, but I, I think we're going to do that, Congressman. And I, and I hope the next time you, you see that rancher, uh, he, he might agree with you. Mr. Gosar is recognized. So, Mr. Ash, yesterday Lake Havasu Mayor, and I'd like to place this in the record, um, City Mayor Mark Nexon sent a letter uh, to the Havasu Refuge Manager and yourself raising serious concerns about the draft compatibility determination, asking several questions, asking the service to conduct an additional public meeting in Lake Havasu and requesting an extension of public comment period by an additional 60 days. Given that you don't even understand what's going on here and I profess that you, know, you followed all the laws, which in this case are blatantly wrong, how do you expect the American people to understand this flawed proposal to close down more motorized boating on Lake Havasu in 30 days? How do I expect the American people? They to understand uh, that you I, didn't follow process I'll, and I'll, you know nothing about this. Even this was brought up previously to your under, uh, under person and I'll, you still know nothing about it. Mr. Gosar, I, I would suggest that if you want to have a conversation with me about Lake Havasu, that you invite me to your office so that we can have a conversation. What you appear to want to do is confront me in a public hearing, in a congressional hearing. If you want to... You know, Mr. Ash, this is my time. You, you, you have invited this. You have absolutely invited this because in March 22nd, I actually had a conversation with the person underneath you who knew all about this. And when you understand this whole process, and I, I find it offensive that you have no idea about what's going on here. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you going to adhere to the mayor's request and grant a 60-day extension of the public comment period? If the mayor has requested an extension, we will consider it. Will you adhere to the mayor's second request and host an additional public meeting in Lake Havasu? If he's requested it, we will consider it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really taken back by your arrogance, that you, you're here to serve, which is what I'm here to do. And when you hear a necessary need that has been brought up like this, that is so egregious in this application, I expect better from you. I've got another line of questioning. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pierce. 
is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you again, Mr. Ash. Uh, I'm reading from a news release by Brian Hires. Is he an employee of the Fish and Wildlife Service? I do not know. Uh, if he uses the uh, email address fws.gov, is that uh, an indicator that he might be in the agency? It would be. Okay. So he quotes down in that that uh, the new revisions, talking about a, a new proposed rule, simplify the original proposal that petitioners coordinate with states and remove the proposed requirement for petitioners to certify they provided all relevant information on species. So my question is, so you all have removed the requirement that the litigants who are trying to sue to get things settled uh, provide all the relevant data. Why is that? Wouldn't we want all the relevant data? The point of petitioners is that they may or may not have access to all of the relevant data. And, it's, and they, their position is it is our responsibility to assemble all of the relevant data. And, so, and, and that's a fair position on their point, I would say. And, and a petitioner, in the case of delisting, might be a state, it might be an, an oil company, it might be the safari club. And so, but in this case, it was the Center for Biological Diversity in Arizona petitioning is, for the that, dunes of sagebrush lizard to be listed, which you and I discussed at length in my office a couple of years ago. And I would remind you, sir, that the things they presented were not all of the relevant data. In fact, it was me holding a public town hall where we got the guy who wrote the original report 30 or 40 years ago, he came in and showed the pieces of the report that were being omitted by the litigant, mm -hmm. Center for Biological Diversity, mm -hmm. and he showed where his report concluded exactly the opposite of the conclusion they were drawing. When I asked him, had Fish and Wildlife Service contacted him to find out the underlying report, you all were moving towards a, a listing of threatened or endangered in that species, and it was only after he began to talk publicly that no, he had not been contacted by uh, Center for Biological Diversity, or you all, mm -hmm. and I draw great concern from the fact that you're reducing the requirement for litigants people who are going to sue to get species listed, you're going to reduce that. And I, I would yield back again, Madam Chair. We're not reducing requirements. We're reducing the, some of the requirements that we had proposed. But the, the, the net result of our rule that uh, Ms. Lummis referred to is that the requirements on petitioners will be increased not decrease. It uh, sure says here in the news release it's going to remove the proposed requirement for petitioners to certify the that they provided all relevant, all relevant information. All relevant information is significant. Again, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, votes have just been called. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Buck, you have one more question. And Mr. Gosar, you have one more question. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, Director, I, the, the question I have is, uh, I'm, I'm looking at a timeline that was part of the hearing yesterday, it was an exhibit in the hearing yesterday, and uh, it concerns the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf, and uh, it's listed, delisted, listed, delisted, uh, lawsuit listing it, uh, lawsuit delisting it. Um, can, can you give some guarantee to the, the people of this country that uh, we are going to delist the, the gray wolf? Not once and for all. I understand that, you know, who knows what's going to happen down the road, but uh, can we get some certainty on this? Um, I, I, I can tell you my firm belief is that we, are, we will uh, see the delisting of the northern Rocky Mountain wolf. We, it is recovered, and we're... Um, we are working with the state of Wyoming now and with the states of Oregon and Washington. In, in the Great Lakes, uh, we're also working there, and, and we're, we're going to work through that process. It's going to take us longer than we would have hoped it would take, but we, we, we will see the delisting of those uh, species, I believe, in the near future. Um, I'm sorry to ask two questions, but uh, near future. What would be near future? Uh, <laughs> I, I, in the case of the Great Lakes, uh, we're appealing that. I think we're going to win on appeal. I would expect that within the next six months. In the case of the uh, Wyoming wolf, we're working with the state to revise their management plan. It depends upon the speed with which we can do that. Um, but, I, but I would hope certainly within six months to a year, we would see that species delisted as well. 
Um, Mr. Gosar, you are recognized. So, Mr. Ash, I find something interesting in your testimony earlier. You said the law prevents injury to a species, yet the service has been producing genetically modified wolves ever since the January 2015 announcement, and 45 percent of those died last year on your watch. The population of, of the Mexican wolves in the wild actually declined by 12.5 percent. Uh, you're doing a terrible job of managing those wolf populations. And so I want to come back also so on January 16, 2015, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service announced its decision to list the Mexican wolf as an endangered subspecies and arbitrarily, arbitrarily expanded the range of the wolves in which they can roam in Arizona and New Mexico under Section 10J of the ESA. Why did your agency, and, and going back for a second, now you understand why Colorado and Utah should be, should be scared about what's coming. Why did your agency violate the Anti-Deficiency Act and fail to secure the funding for the 10-J non-essential experimental Mexican wolf population program before implementing this new program? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, allegation that we have violated the Anti-Deficiency Act. If you have that evidence, I would ask you to give it to me and I'll look into it. Well, you were on a tight ship here. Regional Director Tuggle admitted this fact on a conference call with stakeholders announcing the program. You know, you want my disdain, you got my disdain, because you come to the front of numerous committees with lack of evidence, lack of science, lack of accountability throughout uh, your agency. And that's what you deserve. And it's a shame that you sit in that position. The gentleman's time has expired. And uh, before I thank our witness and adjourn the meeting, uh, I would like to make a request, Mr. Uh, Director, um, there's a letter dated February 23rd, 2015, uh, wherein uh, Committee Chairman Chaffetz and I requested uh, the raw data for sage grouse. Um, and uh, we have not received that response yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you could uh, refer back to this letter of February 23rd, 2015, and uh, respond to that letter, we would be very grateful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would like to um, uh, thank you once again for your, your generous uh, time this week and uh, appearing before us today. Thank you. If there is no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much.